This episode is sponsored by The Light. The Light was written by Grant Erd and is one man's journey into mental health, drug and steroid addiction, cartels, murder and a spiritual awakening. Loosely based on Grant's life, I found it a compelling read and I was glued from the minute I picked it up till I put it down. Described as train spotting on steroids, The Light will give you a POV into the story of Gavin Black as he navigates a life very similar to the majority of Scottish men. The Light is available now on Amazon and for every copy sold, one pound will be donated to Men Matters. A great story with a great cause attached. It. But if you want to hear the real story behind the light, then keep watching. Grant Erd, Grant Erd, hailing through the streets of Hamlin, coming through the scheme like most of us, found ourselves in the party lifestyle, which eventually led into addiction, depression, and in desperation, you found recovery. Now you live out in Dubai, a new man, and have just released your debut novel, The Light, which is a story adapted from your own experiences and channeled into a fictional tale. So in order to gain some context about the experiences that went into your book and what led you here today, can you just give us a background into your early life? Yeah, no worries, Jordan, and uh, thanks for having me on. Much, much appreciated. You're welcome. So I grew up in Hamilton, South Warwickshire, just outside Glasgow. Um, I was the youngest of three, so older brother, older sister. Uh, my father and mother both worked full time, obviously with three children, times were a bit hard. Um, so my mother and father worked, which was which was the norm back there, is, uh, the norm back then. Good enough childhood, growing up, you know, um, we went to the kind of primary school, local high school. Um, in terms of my father, he was quite a character, if you like, um, quite disciplinarian. So he wasn't, growing up in that era, I guess it wasn't to, it was the norm if you're going to get a wee backhand or something like that, you know. So that kind of became a bit of the norm. If you've done something wrong, then you knew you're going to get your ass kicked, basically, um, which was which was fine, you know, because that that's the way um, things were back then. So growing up, it was, um, for me, Normal, normal childhood. I wasn't the most popular guy in, in the school, but I wasn't the most unpopular guy either. Um, so it was good. It was decent. But what I would say from quite an early age, going back to even primary school, um, I felt like I felt as if I was a constant warrior. Um, it's very, very early. Maybe even primary five, primary six. I got this kind of full. Demon a Darkness that is almost like kind of joined me at this young age. And I became a prolific warrior all the way through primary school, all into secondary school. I worried about everything, worried about my parents, uh, my, my dad losing his job. I worried if people liked me. I, I worried about how I interacted with people. But again, on the outside looking in, people would have never known that. You know, people would have thought, oh, grads, like confidence. I went to boxing, I boxed amateur for seven years from 12, well, six years, 12 to 18. So there was that kind of persona of confidence, um, a bit of ability to fight, played football, I was quite good at football, done okay with the ladies. Um, but I guess in the background there, there was this, which I now know to be anxiety and depression. So I guess like for the, the worrying side of it, um, that kind of manifested when, from, I guess, like how my father was, you know, because I was always worried as, how's it going to react, what's it going to do, like, am I going to get a skeleton here? Uh, walking on eggshells, and that type of thing. Is it a lack of Basically, walking? Yeah. Oh, kind of of building, yeah. Right, okay, okay. Okay, okay, so see, uh, yeah. Yeah. When you when you say that, so see, obviously you had like your issues with your father, and that that was kind of the catalyst for where the anxiety started. How? What age did the kind of stuff with your dad actually start? Did was it? Could you even remember when it started, or was it just a constant thing? Yeah, just like kind of a constant thing, I think, because there was three of us, you know. So my brother was four years older, so my dad was quite disciplinarian to him, you know, um, and then also my sister as well. So that was kind of part of growing up, part of our kind of childhood. 
Um, I guess kind of walking on eggshells is it the best way to put it. You're always in that kind of fear of mm-hmm. not doing the right thing. If you didn't do the right thing, then you knew you were going to get a wage or something more. Um, so yeah, so then that kind of manifested into this kind of worrying. And I guess if you think about it a bit, being in fear all the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, definitely. You're in constantly in fight or flight response. And our bodies are conditioned for that. It's essentially, that's why we look at a lot of soldiers that come back from uh, war zones with PTSD because your body's no accustomed to being in that condition. So when it does become like that, it's, uh, it's toxic. Toxic for yeah. your emotional state. So was there any way to see at a young age, as you say, you've done boxing, which I feel is a great vessel for expression where you've got any like, kind of suffering from any, any kind of like, if you we'll use the term mental mental illness of that as such, if you're suffering in any way, I feel boxing's great. I do about a boxing myself. But uh, was uh, what did you develop any mechanisms that would help you cope with your anxiety? And did as you got older, did the the anxiety in the book? Because there's a thing where you talk about your demon, and there was a thing I wanted to ask your style of writing. So the way you write demon, it's like. For anybody, when they purchase the book, it's the capital E and M, it's, uh, that's capitalised. I was wondering yeah. if there was like a significant meaning behind that. Yeah, I was just to like, so like, like if you spelt it backwards, it was me. I thought that, I thought that was the case. I thought that, see, when I was looking at it, because I was trying to figure out, I was like, why does that keep saying it like that? And uh, I thought maybe that's what it means, uh, is me backwards, but I just wanted yeah. to make sure. Yeah, I guess that was kind of, I'll be back kind of the play on words and, like for for me, like as I say, like this kind of, I guess you can all call it an affliction, um, and unfortunately, as we know now, like with the amount of awareness around mental health, certainly men's mental health, it is excellent, you know. But for me, I was I was in silence for so long. Um, I think it came to a kind of head when I was maybe eighteen, and I went to the doctor's local um, general practice, general practitioner doctors. And at the time, back then, like you're trying to explain something that you didn't really understand yourself. And automatically, they were saying, right, okay, this is what it is. You're suffering from anxiety, depression. And they put me on antidepressants. If you've ever took antidepressants, or if you know people that take antidepressants, for the first seven days or ten days, you feel horrendous. You know, they make you feel even worse before you actually kick in. And at 18, I was already having, like, kind of very, very, I guess, dark thoughts, you know, at that, at that age, 18. And when I started taking these tablets, I, I was I was gone, you know what I mean? I was like, no, 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 I can't, I can't, I um, can't handle it. So I'd only lasted five days on them, and I stopped. And within a, within maybe four or five days, I was kind of back to normal. The normal being, I was, I was, like, better than I was on the, on the tablets, but still having the kind of anxiety, depression, and the the kind of dark thoughts, if you like. Yeah. And then, I guess, 18, I went on my first holiday, um, first large holiday, and I get, um, you start to... I guess when we were growing up as well, in that era, you start to drink at a very early age. You know, you're drinking at maybe 13, 14, up the park. I bought a Mad Dog 2020, I bought a Buckfast. So that that was already ingrained. But then when I went on holiday, like other things kind of started to creep in, other substances, other um, other recreational drugs, if you like. When I was reading your book, I was uh, looking at that part and see, because I knew I was a fictionalised account of a real life situation, and uh, I did believe that at the start that was uh, more the kind of autobiography autobiography side of uh, the story, but. When I was looking, reading at it, and uh, when you're going to your first lads holiday, I'm not going to give away any spoilers for anybody that's uh, going to purchase the book, but that's where the first kind of voyage into drug taking actually occurs. And me being myself, I've, I've been in recovery. I, I, I know the story. I know the dance. So when I seen the character was uh, starting the the first kind of the first signs of drug use, and uh, it did it exhibited what. The character said it kind of helped keep the demon at bay, but then then my reader was like, ah, right, for how much longer? It's almost like a cliffhanger because I know exactly where it's going. So, as time went on, like, at what point did it start to spiral for you? Like this kind of 
this lifestyle because it started off as a recreational thing, but did it ever get to a point where it decided or it started getting out of hand? At that point, like, it was like weekends, you know, like, my weekends was my escape. Like, when I went through the week, you're working through the week, and then you're out to the weekend, and it's like, wow, this is this is brilliant, this is amazing, this is, this is the person I want to be. And I'd left school, I didn't have any real aspirations of what I wanted to do, so I was in and out kind of lower paid jobs, or I was working full time in a supermarket, um, I then went into like a couple of call centres, and then I started a position, well, off, I was actually offshore in the oil rigs at 21, but that didn't last very long because I got paid I got paid off the, the oil rig went into um, the shipyard. I started a position as a trainee scaffolder, uh, working for a, a large company in Glasgow. And as a, as a trainee scaffolder, it was the systems side of scaffolding. So systems is like um, quick stage and cut lock. It's not the tubing and fitting uh -huh, you uh -huh. see in and around uh, in Glasgow. Mm. So this was like all the like housing estates I was working on. And I, and I quickly real, realised that what they would do, they would get like, the part two scaffolder, the qualified scaffolder, they would go around, base out the houses of the base for the, the, the kit to go up, and then they would get anybody like, out of the pub or whatever to come and finish this scaffold off. So it used to be like on a Monday morning, they must have went to the pub and said, anyone want a shift? And you get these fucking bum pots working for them. <laughs> it was absolutely crazy. And at that point... um my tradesman who was meant to be training me lovely big guy um i won't mention his name i don't i don't know where he is now but he was very quiet when we were working and i think i'd been working with him for about six months and he finally can i said to him well, Grant, i've got something to tell you um i've not been quite honest i'm just out of the jail um for armed robbery i'm a career criminal he says all right okay i says well he says i in the last 18 months of my sentence or something, they start to re rehabilitize you. And they asked them what trade they wanted to do. They said you could be a, a joiner, um, a gas engineer, whatever, because I think you'd done eight years. Because the guy that he, he was um, robbing the um, the security truck with, he shot the guard. So it was like armed robbery, attempted murder or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so he was doing eight years. So anyway, he wanted to be a scaffolder. So he learned how to be a scaffolder in jail um, and then when he came out his friend gave him a job he'd done six months and then he just lied in his CV to say he had like 12 years experience so this he was very very slow um, nice big guy but the two of us I didn't have a clue you know um, and he he had met a girl one of his pen pals when he was in jail these girls started to write to the um, the prisoners and they got very close. She came and started visiting him. And they got married as soon as he came out. And they put everything on credit cards so that he was in debt up to his eyeballs. So the big man said to me, he says, look, Grant, we've got to go to price work. Um, and I says, all right, okay. And I'm thinking to myself, we've got no chance, man. She says, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll need to give them money, you know. And... Um, but anyway, we started, and I remember on the Monday morning, and he says, um, I've got a wee, a wee surprise for you, a wee live nut. And it was a wee speed bomb. Um, and he says, this will help us. <laughs> Fucking, this will help us work. So obviously, I'd been out all weekend, and made major come down. I was like, okay, that's fine. And I think that's when it started to kind of go wrong, very much wrong, you know, when you're doing it at your work, and... Um, so that kind of spiralled at that age. At that age, I was maybe, I think it was 23, um, 24. I had also embarked at the age of 21. I found kind of anabolic steroids, and that became a big part of my, my journey as well. Um, for anybody that's taken steroids or anybody that knows people, it's a journey in itself, you know, like a lot of people say, oh, you don't get any side effects, fucking bullshit. Nah, and your body is only, your, your body only produces a certain amount of estrogen, yeah. 
and then you're flooding it. So you do become maybe not a different person, but you're certainly you behave differently because of the the hormone in you is like tenfold, you know. Um, so this results th- th- this point in my life is a bit chaotic, you know. Um, and I guess it came to a head when I was twenty five. I think I had I was maybe about ten thousand pounds in debt, still staying with my mum and dad taking a lot of substances and I'm still kind of working as a scaffolder thinking I wasn't going to get anywhere in life um, and the, the anxiety, the depression was at like an all-time high at that point um, and that was then there's a part in the book where the main character kind of ends up in hospital after trying to take his own life and that's basically all true, you know um, I just, it was a Saturday night, I'd been out and just thought, well, nothing's working, you know, and nothing's, nothing I'm doing is right. And this, the, the demon, as I call it, was just completely, like, there constantly. Um, and I couldn't actually, like, get rid of it. And I just took an abundance of fucking anything that was in the cupboard. Um, and I remember just lying down on the kitchen floor and, I don't know. I don't know how long I was out for, but it was actually my brother and my best friend that managed to. In my wisdom, I'd closed all the doors, put locks on all the doors, put the music on, put keys in the doors, the locks of the doors. Still a parents house, but I'd put keys in them so nobody could get in. Mm-hmm. Um, my mum was down visiting my sister in London. My dad was working away, so I was in the house myself. And it was only my my mum's neighbour who'd heard the music. We call on at one o'clock in the morning, she'd come round and then she phoned my brother and he'd come up and they're just about to leave and my brother seen my arm on the, the kind of, just uh, in my arm, they were on the kitchen floor and he put the back window in, come in and took me up to here Myers and they kind of pumped my stomach. And you wake up the next morning, like I was on the, um, I guess they call it a suicide watch, um, I was just the... Uh, the kind of, um, the, 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 the kind of bed right behind the nurses station. Um, and at that point I was, I was gone, you know what I mean? Like I didn't, like, you're, you're just kind of completely an emotional wreck. And I remember sitting on the edge of the bed, just staring at the floor, this kind of pool of tears. Um, and again, there's a bit in the book, which is all true. I don't, I don't hear the nurse coming in. The nurse comes in, she puts her arm around me and she says, what's wrong, son? And at the time, I never even looked at her. I was just looking down. I just said, I don't know, I'm completely lost. I'm just, I'm fucked. And that, again, that wee nurse, like what I said in the book, she probably saved my life, you know. She said, look, son, whatever you're thinking now, whatever your bad thoughts are, just try and channel that into something good. And she asked me at the time, what do you want to do? Do you have a dream? Is there anything you want to do? And I remember saying to her, I said, I want to get a job that I can travel the world. I want to travel. And she says, we'll do that. She says, this hurt, this anger, this pain that you're feeling for yourself, channel that into that to try and realise your dream. And at the time, like, I didn't think that went in. That did definitely penetrate into my subconscious. Um, And I think from that day on, I started to put things in motion. I retrained, spent a fortune, been back and doing like health and safety qualifications. I managed to get back into the oil, oil and gas industry. And from maybe late thirties through to forty, I was flying. You know what I mean? I was like, kind of doing so well, um, traveling all over the world, flying business class, flying first class, staying in Dubai. Um, but unfortunately, that kind of darkness, that demon, I'd never actually cured it. I'd never actually managed to fix it. And only four years ago, it came ahead again. You know what I mean? I was kind of, I lost, I lost it. Um, ended up losing my business, my marriage, my house. Um, again, because I, I couldn't, I went back down into the, and back down at the tunnel, if you like, you know, back down into the kind of the dark side of things, uh, down the yellow brick road. So basically, see, see uh, if 
it's actually it's no funny, but I see I I was in the exact same spot. I can I ask what what uh, scaffolding company did you work for in Glasgow? You want me to tell you? Yeah. Aye. I- Interself. Interself. I used to work for S G V. That's why I'm asking. Right. That's why I'm asking. Uh, I I done scaffolding as well. Well, well, you know it's like and. Uh, it's it's almost it's see you find scaffolders are usually it's strange. It's one of the few jobs on site that mostly gets drug tested, but yet it's probably got the most drug users. It's fucking insane. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I I done scaffolding, and at the same time I done scaffolding, I also done steroids as well. And uh, <laughs> I I I done ste- I must just come I did that. I was also doing drugs yeah. as well, but it was kind of near the end of my drug using. I say at the end of my drug using, the end of my heavy drug using with the cocaine and that kind of stuff. But uh, it's one of the jobs. It's like don't get me wrong. It's it can be good money. It's uh, building sites. I think they just all encompasses the same thing. See, unless you're doing something with yourself like health and safety where. You can have a more managerial role or something like that. I yes. maybe, but constantly on site, especially scaffolding. You're sometimes out in the mud. It's alright when it's fucking a nice day in that man, but yeah, you've never really got an easy shift scaffolding unless you're skiving. No. You know what I'm no. talking about? So I uh, enjoyed it, but I enjoyed I enjoyed the madness of it, and like I, I guess like, but at the time like when I was looking at it, like you you want you want to see progression. And I remember when I started like. The tradesman that I was working with in the beginning, just a young guy, he just constantly smoked joints. It's funny. Um, and he was like £240 a week. And I was like, is that all you're making? You know, and I was like, ah, what? Because it was the system side. But obviously the tubing and fitting guys were making a lot more. They were making five, six hundred. Um, and I was like, well, I want more than that. You know what I mean? I had aspirations. So that, that, that kind of environment, I guess... Made me even more depressed a little bit because thinking, fucking hell, how am I going to survive in two hundred forty pound a week as I get older? You know, is that's what they were making in their top end, um, sorry, after tax. Yeah, it was crazy, crazy. Ah, uh, as it's a mental job, you meet some mental people, and uh, that was a a thing. That, I, I just must be a common thing because when I done scaffolding, don't get me wrong, people were making more than two hundred and forty a week, but they were still fucking complaining because they've already complained about was the wages are shit in here. Yeah. It was all priced work. Mainly, I was a labourer. I, I was a labourer for two years. I never got any progression. I just, I just didn't get it. I, I, I could scaffold. I could build a scaffold, but I was clumsy as fuck. I would drop fucking ledgers off scaffoldings and hit cunts and all by accident, obviously. So I was like, ah, maybe I'm gonna end up fucking killing some cunt. But my fucking health and safety's worst nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> See if I can ask you. So you said four years ago. That uh, you fell back into that darkness, you mm-hmm. you lost your marriage and your business. What was it that that happened? Would you be able to kind of go into it? what kind of occurred? Did, was it was it like the kind of drug use side of things, or was that another yeah. end on your life? Well, I most mostly the kind of substances. Yeah, it got to a point where it was just like too much, you know, like with it, um, alcohol and things like that as well. And what I was doing, I didn't seem as a problem. You know what I mean? And, Again, when we like, talk about addiction and talk about addicts, like there's this big misconception. Like we think we we were brought up in my certainly my generation. If you're an addict, you're like it was a train spotting. You know what I mean? Or if you're an addict, you're like an alky, the alky with the brown bag. You know, really like, sit in the street, uh, like JK. Um, but if you look at it now, I mean, there's so many people that are addicts and they don't realise it. You know, like. If you're a habitual user, a habitual user of alcohol every single weekend, you rely on that drug. You're an addict. You know what I mean? And like some people don't realise that, or they'll be posting during the week with a glass of wine, or oh, it's a Wednesday, a hard shift, or oh, it's a Thursday, another hard shift, and then Friday, Saturday, Sunday. They're addicts, you know, and they don't realise it. And I think that was me as well. I didn't realise I had a problem. I didn't realise I had a big problem. Um, my wife was trying to tell me, look what you're doing is completely wrong. Um, and I was still working away at the time. I was working the oil wrecks. I was I was coming home and I was using every single day I was home. Um, and that's when it becomes, you've got that kind of social side of these substances, but then they don't become social and you just want to be on your own with them. Uh, that's when you, fuck, this is, this is bad. Um, but out of that, out of that kind of madness, if you like, and out of the madness of the careers, the jobs that I've had, like in the book, 
the main characters, Dubai, Trinidad, Africa, and these are places I've all been to. Obviously, I still live in Dubai. Um, so these are places that I've all been, I've, I've worked and lived in. So that was that was where the kind of basis I started to get an idea for the story when I was when I was working in Colombia. Not the best place to when <laughs> you've got a bit of problem. Um, got a job in Colombia, which was unbelievable. Um, and that's that's where the, the basis of the job, um, sort of the story came from. And the story was very much going to be just like a lad story, you know, just this mad, wild journey of smuggling drugs and which. Uh, it is, but as my, as I was trying to recover for my own mental health, I was going on a kind of spiritual journey. I met a, a lovely woman who rented an office out in my training centre back in Hamilton when I had my health and safety business. Um, she, she, I've still got it, she's still there. But she, she does Reiki, holistic therapies. And I was doing Reiki, I was starting to do meditation, doing breath work. So as my as my own personal journey to try and recover, I started to get more ideas from the book. And then maybe three years ago, I'd started to write the book for like four years ago. And I didn't I didn't quite understand where the ending was going to go. And at the time I was at the height of this Laps where I was in a bad way again, like every weekend and well, every day when I was at home. And one of my friends said to me, he says, You want to try DMT, dimethyltryptyline? So I started to do the research on that. And I says, Yeah, this sounds very interesting because I was looking for something. I needed some sort of, I need something to tell me to say, Look, Grant, what you're doing is wrong. You know what I mean? You're going to fucking kill yourself. I knew that, but. It was almost as if I needed to see the light. I needed to get that light bulb moment. So I done it with my friend. Um, we free based it, and I I never blasted off. They say you need to blast off. I never got that blast off. So I put it in my drawer. It was in a vape machine. Put it in the put it in my drawer, and I said that's that, that's not worked. And I think I'd been on a, a complete mad one for a week. And I took maybe four days off, and I was thinking to myself, "What? Well, I don't know what I don't know what to do here. I just keep on getting this spiral of using, stopping, using, stopping." And I remember sitting. I was in, my, in the house myself. It was a Monday morning. I said, "Fuck it, I'm going to try this DMT." And um, I went up, and this time I made sure I was taking in like big, big, big inhales, big inhales, and I just boom away I went. I remember lying back in my bed, getting all these different. Um, kaleidoscopic, geometrical um, symbols flying at me. It was all red in colour. All these bright, bright colours. And then it was as if I kind of fell. And I can only describe it as if it was at a casino. Because I kept, I kept on hearing like these like noises of like like the puggy machines, like the like the bandit machines, like as if pe people were playing like... Um, and it was as if it was a roulette, a roulette wheel spinning. And then it was all these kind of like like female silhouettes, but they'd like to the skull heads and they're all like flying at me laughing. It was all red, this pure blood, blood red. And then I closed my eyes tighter and then I just seen this unbelievable bright light. It was like biblical, hence the reason for the name of the book. And I was like, wow. And up in the sky, or up, up, not the sky, but I was looking up into this light. I could see these entities, just silhouettes of figures. And it was as if they were looking down, like, as if one of them was reaching out. But then by when I was back in this casino, back in the red, I was like, fuck, fuck, fuck. I was trying to, try to close my eyes again, try to get back into this light. So when I woke up from that, I was like, wow. I started to digest. Because I remembered quite a lot of it. A lot of people say when they do DMT, they don't remember it because it's too quick. But I, I remembered so much, mm -hmm. and it was so vivid. And I thought, I thought like the the casino, the the redness. I thought that was hell, yeah. And I thought, fuck, and the light was heaven. And I'm thinking to myself, fuck, no man, this is this is me seeing like my death almost. But then as I was speaking to someone, and they were saying, well. 
this is you kind of gambling with your life. What you're doing just now, you're gambling with your life. All your, your the abuse you're doing to your body, all the risks you're taking. Maybe that's the kind of analogy of the casino. And then when you broke into the light, that's your higher state of consciousness. That's what you can have. But you're stuck here, you're doing all this shit. If you keep doing it, yeah. Or that's what you can have. And I was like, I'm actually getting tingles when I'm mm-hmm. telling you this as well. I'm getting big um, vibrations going through my body. And I was like, ah, wow, you know. And then that kind of completely took me on a whole new trajectory of my life about down the rabbit hole with psychedelic drugs and psilocybin and ayahuasca. I know you've done that itself. And that then changed the whole route of the book. That then went for me saying, right, now I've got an ending for the book. The book was actually called Cocaine Roughnecks. I used to be a roughneck offshore in the oil rigs and I was going to smuggle the cocaine on an, on an oil drill ship, so cocaine roughnecks. But then once I'd done this DMT, I saw the light and I said, no, I'm going to change this. I'm going to now... Because it has changed me as a person because now I'm doing, I'm doing my second master's degree in the neuroscience and psychology of mental health. Since doing DMT, I've done, I'm now a qualified breathwork coach, a qualified medita- guided meditation coach, positive psychology coach. And once I get my master's, what I want to then do is now move into a coaching side of things like mental health. Um, the master's that I'm doing, my dissertation, my project, will all be around psychedelic drugs. Um, I'm, I'm doing so much research. I've got a lot of a lot of good friends out here, believe it or not, in Dubai, um, that are all practicing. You know, they've got kind of, um, they've all found the medicine, if you like, as well. And I think, like, the, the power that these medicines have is unbelievable. And the, the, the big pharma, the big pharmaceutical, I love that argument, you know, I love the fact that these medicines, these plant medicines are now potentially going to take over Big Pharma and get rid of all these um, antidepressant drugs that they don't treat the cure, they just keep you hooked, you know what I mean? And that's all the Big Pharma want you to be, they just want you to be hooked. I've been on sertraline, which is an SSRI or serotonin, um, I can't remember the full name of it, but basically it's anti-anxiety, anti-depression. I've been on that for five years now. And trying to get off those drugs is very, very hard. Very hard. I've tried it twice. I've failed twice. But now through the people I've been speaking to out here, I've now got, they've given me a protocol um, of all these different medicines, plant medicines, that basically help with your digestion, um, they, they clean out all the parasites in your gut, and they, they help you come off your antidepressants um, with a view that you can then start microdosing psilocybin. Because the, the benefits that are around microdosing psilocybin is unbelievable. So that whole, that whole journey for me of like the madness, the chaos, doing DMT, seeing the light, then the book, I was like that with the book. <clears throat> I've got an ending here, I've got an ending. Um, and then obviously trying to now, for the second, as you know, I don't want to spoil it, but the ending of the book sets up the next journey. Mm-hmm. And the next journey, it will be called, it's called The Awakening. And that will all be about the main character. He still has to, he's convinced himself that he has to do the wrong thing to get the right results. Mm-hmm. So he's still going to be in the chaos doing naughty things with the ambition that he's going to open this psychedelic rehab clinic somewhere at Costa Rica or wherever it may be. So he needs the money to open this clinic. So that would be the basis of the next book. Mm-hmm. Fantastic, mate. Fantastic. See, uh, I could really relate to see the first time you done DMT. Well, the first time you had the breakthrough. First time I smoked DMT was in a bit of love, my pal's living room. And uh, I just done the one hit, but I don't know if it was just because it was my first time, maybe he gave me a big hit, but it was enough. It sent me somewhere. And uh, I felt as if I went on that, it was like a spiritual roller coaster. 
if you're, you're getting stuck to your body and pull, you're going somewhere, you don't know where you're going, but you're going somewhere. And I reached that point, it was like, what well, I like, it was, I thought it was if I died and went to heaven, but no, it was in what I'd, it was like almost like a, maybe an ego death. Sometimes I'm still trying to dissect it and see when you're talking about that reaching the light, because where I look at where my life is now, the EMT really changed my life to a, to a certain point like, as well. I think uh, you you were the same in your book, and I had really bad OCD, really bad. I was one of the people, like, see if you're a young age, I had, I used to be one of the people, I'd need, to, like, I'd need to slam a door three times and all that. I'd, I'd need to do everything in threes, which is strange. I'd need to turn the telly off it, name and all that. Yeah, it was because I was reading that and I just remember there when he says it. And uh, to the point, I, I tried to stop doing I had all these wee habits and I was like, if I don't do this, something bad's going to happen. All this. And, and I looked back now, it was just, it was anxiety. But uh, there was so many times I, it, it got to the point it was really affecting my life and see if I was uh, what, at a stressful point in my life or whatever, the, the OCD would get worse. And there would be times I'd be like, ah, this is kind of starting to... What, overpower my life like if I was wanting to leave my house yeah. it would take me like 10-15 minutes just to get out the door because I had to do all these wee rituals yes. so to the point it was like this is yeah. really yeah. I so yeah. I tried to stop doing all my wee wee habits and wee rituals and so many times I always fell back into them I smoked DMT once disappeared or the OCD it was like suddenly I had this realisation and I try and explain it to people but I just realised I was like ah, this doesn't matter and I don't know what it is, it's like, this doesn't make a difference, and it just, since that day, I don't get me wrong, I'm still a wee bit here and there, but I'm nowhere near what I used to be, and it was just like, that was after once, and uh, that, that, I think what you're saying about the, having a glimpse at that higher state of consciousness, <clears throat> I've smoked DMT a number of times, and I remember one time, I was actually thinking about this last night, so it's funny you say that, where it kind of, it almost as if it stripped away, or that kind of negative fog you have of yourself, and it showed me the best version of myself, who I could be, and all it was was just taking away that self-doubt, or this this uh, self-loathing, as if it just stripped all that away and just went, there you go. It was like it was like a perfect image, and it was like, this is very attainable. So I could totally relate to that experience, man, and the ayahuasca is different gravy. It's like, it's... It, I, I seen my future so you've obviously watched my documentary and if you've not watched my documentary anybody that's watched this go and check it out it's very very good very good thanks very much thanks very much mate and uh, it was hard that obviously I done. I think I'd done my best describing the experience but the thing is as well it's a sacred ceremony and I can understand they didn't want cameras in during the ceremony but I'm kind of glad as well because I didn't want to be sitting drinking ayahuasca then having to think about is that camera recording this and that I just wanted to kind of zone in the experience but it is, it's a wild ride, and you realise, what well, obviously us been coming to the West, what well, the pharmaceutical industry is massive here, but you look at like your ayahuasca, I've, so I've done microdosing and that in the past, I'm totally abstinent now, I don't know anything like that, but uh, your cambo, like your meditation, like these things, like I meditate every day, it's like my life is, is polar opposites from what it used to be a good few years ago, and there's people in like... Uh, and in India, Asia, and all that, these kind of places that have been doing this stuff for centuries. It's like we live in such a golden age of information where, as you say, your ayahuasca, your, your uh, knowledge of plant medicines, your knowledge of breath work, and the benefits that accessibility to this stuff, it's, it's so wide and vast. We're very, very privileged to have this. Yeah, no, you're 100% right. And I guess when you go down the rabbit hole, like doing a lot of research for book number two and I've spent, as I said, I've spent most of my life in the oil and gas industry so I've also been fascinated with the oil journey and J.D. Rockefeller, who was the kind of pioneer, the oil tycoon, he was America's first billionaire and he owned, in the early 1900s, he owned 90% of the world's oil. The guy was mega, mega rich, rich beyond belief. But he became a paranoid rep, and he he it was him that created like like industrial espionage, like putting spies into other companies. And during this time, his chemists discovered petrochemicals, and he realised a derivative of petrochemicals could make drugs. So he started selling these drugs to cure things like back then, like 
um, herpes or syphilis was quite big back then. But because they were derivatives of oil, they were toxic. Uh, so they were making people worse and they were giving people cancer, right? But Rockefeller, because he had so much money, he says, no, no, I'm going to pursue this. So he he bought IG Fairbairn. IG Fairbairn, a German pharmaceutical company. And if you type in Google IG, IG Fairbairn World War II, it was them that were doing all this shit with, the, uh, with Hitler for the gas chambers and all that. Hey, okay. And bad, bad, bad company. Rockefeller employed them. Employed this doctor, I think it was, a guy called Flexner. And he said to Flexner, go into all the medical institutes in America and see how we are practicing medicine. So this Flexner went in. He discovered that we're using um, holistic therapies, plants, herbs, and fungi. That's how we were treating. That's what the, the doctors were using. They were doing all research from indigenous, indigenous tribes. So in the early 1900s, Western medicine was all based on holistic therapies, plants, herbs, fungi. Rockefeller knew, I can't make any money off of this. So fuck you. He railroaded all these medical institutions with his money. He then wrote the medical, he introduced the medical institution he then said that if you want to practice medicine in the Western world, you have to come to my institution. You will practice with my drugs. And these drugs were classed as allopathic drugs, which means that they'll treat the symptoms, not the cure. Mm -hmm. Big Pharma was born. And that is how much fucking brainwashed we've been. The J.D. Rockefeller, it was all about money, nothing about curing people. It was all about money. And the fact that in the early 1900s, we were using plants, we were using herbs, and he just railroaded it. So, I mean, the rabbit hole is unbelievable when you start to go down it and how much brainwashing that we've had. Um, but I think with these medicines, with the internet, with people like yourself doing the documentaries, there is an awakening coming. I think that people are not putting up with the bullshit anymore, you know, we're not putting up with the fact that, I think people, are, as I say, they're waking up, people are starting to realise that we have been led down a garden path for most of it, for most of our lives. Uh -huh. Yeah, totally, and that's the thing, with J.D. Rockefeller, as you say, he was the, America's first billionaire, probably, you look at the Rockefellers as an institution, if you adjust inflation, probably the richest in history, Probably still are people yeah. widely believe the Rockefellers to be controlling the world and that. Yeah. I wouldn't dispute that. And you, it begs the question, like, how much fucking money does people need? <laughs> I mean, you're mega rich, but you want merits. Like, that goes into a point where it, it, I think it ceases to be about money and it becomes more about power. It's yeah. more, And as you say, he was massively paranoid. He, he was probably the pioneer of uh, industrial espionage. That all stems from what I believe to be control. And quite recently, when I done my Alaska, I learned a lot of my issues stem to control. And control is massively down to fear in a lot of cases. And that's that fear. And it's, that's the thing with psychedelics as well that I learned, which massively helped me like, during my experience with the ayahuasca ceremony. Like, you need to surrender. And you need to surrender to the experience. And that's the same with life. Like, I'm realising with life, let's see... I, I was reading The Power of Now, or it was an audio book, so I listened to it, but it can't tell, and that's about living in the present moment and surrendering, and I don't believe in coincidences, no, I mean, I believe if, if a certain certain thing pops up more than once, you're meant to hear it, or you're meant to connect to it, and see that living in the present moment and going with the flow of life, it's, uh, it's a beautiful thing, because suddenly life becomes beautiful again, you're, you're dealing with the spontaneity of life, you're not suddenly preempting what you're going to be doing, I'm going to do a podcast, then I'm going to go and do this, then I'm going to go and do that, then I'm going to have my dinner, then I'm going to go to bed, and then that's your life. And when you forecast it in such a way, it does become meaningless. But we live in that kind of an age where it's, it's life as well. It's understandable. You need to be, you need to be obviously clever in the sense if you get bills to pay, you get responsibilities, you, you can't be reckless. But there's at the same point as well where you just need to ground yourself in the present moment and... 
when you tie it all in with the psychedelics, with uh, the ayahuasca, the DMT, and all that, they all kind of they they all sing for the same hymn sheet, for lack of a better description. Yeah. So, see, writing. No, I think it's something I thought it. Yeah. On you, on you go. Look, sorry, on you go. No, on you go, John. On you go. So I was going to ask. So see, no, I was just like I was just. <laughs> you go. You go. You go. Right. Okay. No, I was just agreeing with you. I was just agreeing with you, but being in the present moment. And again, my journey now with the meditation, the breath work, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm not I'm not great at it yet. My my thoughts still do run away with me. But I'm very much trying to realise that the present is the only thing that we have. It is the true gift, you know what I mean? Um, and as you say, once you can... Uh, I still do have a problem with spiralling negative thoughts. But what I do now try and do is just say, oh, Grant, okay... Look where you are, look at the trees, look at the nice day, look at the sun, and just bring, ground myself back into the present moment. And it does work, it works 100%. Definitely, man, definitely. And it seems so simple, but it's the simple stuff that always works. But can I just ask you, whilst writing the light, see the process of doing it, what did that do for you mentally? Do you feel as if that helped close a chapter in your life? Uh, or did you feel anything changed at all? No, I definitely, I definitely, as I said, because of when I'd done DMT, I was at that point, I was probably breaking point where I was having these very, very dark thoughts again. Um, and then allowing me to see the fact that this book was now so much more than just this kind of crazy lad's book. I had this underlying message that I could now put a bit in my journey to say, right, hey, okay, this is a this is a struggle. However, there is light out there, and try and promote the message around mental health through the book. Finishing the book was very very hard. Well, not hard, but it was just time consuming because when I started the book, I, I'm just like right, 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 right. I had no no right experience. And it was just like a big mass of pearly words, if, if that makes any sense. And so then I found an editor, lovely, lovely um, woman, Kirsten Rees. She's from Uddingston. She was fantastic. You know, she took my book and says, right, okay, you've got something here, but we need to work on it. You know, there's a lot of um, structure that we need to put in. And it was actually written all basically in the past tense. It was all all about the main character, thinking back, thinking back. But now I had to rewrite it, put a lot more dialogue in it, put it in the present, but with him sometimes looking back. So she helped with that. Um, I then had to get a formatter. So during all this, I guess from my own side of things, it allowed me, I had something to concentrate on. So it's allowed these maybe negative thoughts, my anxiety, my depression, that was almost controlled because I had this book, you know, that focus, you know, and I was like, yes, this is this is great. And the fact that I was now trying to say, right, I want to get this message out, I want to help people, that was helping me as well, you know. And as I, as I mentioned, I'm now going to try and start to transition into a new career, and the career's all going to be around mental health, mental well-being, promoting that within men, men's health as well. So the book certainly changed my life. It changed the direction of my life. Backed with, obviously, DMT. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I, I think it certainly, it certainly took me on a journey, that's for sure. Uh, it definitely is a journey, man, and it's one I went on with you when I read it. There was a quote for the book that really stood out to me by Marianne Williamson, and I really connected with it. I'm just going to read it for the audience. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear in that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who have you not to be? You're a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightening about shrinking so that other people won't feel unsure around you. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It is not just in some of us, it is in everyone, as we let our own light shine. We consciously give other people permission to do the same. 
as we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Where did you first hear that quote? So that was in a, it was in a film. It's Stanley Carter, um, Samuel 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 L. Jackson, Coach Carter, I think it is. Um, and that I, I just resonated with me straight away. And I, in my training centre, my health and safety training centre, I had all these um, quotes on the wall, and that was one of them. Um, because I wanted that, like I wanted to see that every day. And I think that's hundred percent true. And I sit and in, in the kind of the world that we've grown up in as well. Like sometimes, like again, it's not like your parents' fault, but in society, it was almost like you did. People didn't want you to do too well. You know what I mean? Like people, they wanted you to to do okay, but maybe not better than them. You know uh-huh. what I mean? Um, there's a bit of je- a lot of jealousy. But that that poem for me was like wow, you know and. We do have this light inside of us, hundred percent. We do, and if you like, if you think about your consciousness and your subconsciousness, maybe ten percent of your your reality is um, only ten percent, and the other ninety percent is based on what you think it or the. I kind of mean, I explain that right. Um, so we've got so much inside us that we're not tapped into, and again, going back to the higher state of consciousness, it all comes back to that: the light that you have inside you, the light that you have in here is unbelievable and I think like these things the phones and everything else that we have is is slowly it's putting out that light you know what I mean and it's certainly for the, the next generation coming through the like chat GTP it's almost as if you don't need to think anymore you know so you've got an, an, a generation of, of kids coming through they're brought up on the phone the focus, you know what I mean? They can't focus on anything because everything's here. Boredom, they don't get bored anymore. Like when we were young, you were out and you had to go and find something to do. You're way down the barn on your rope swings or whatever. And that was brilliant. But they don't have that anymore. They don't have that scarcity um, because they don't need to be bored. Well, they're bored and they're still watching this. So I think um, that poem, when you, when you listen to the words... It's extremely, extremely powerful. Um, and again, naming the book The Light was part of that poem as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I know, it was a beautiful poem, man, and I really connected with it. And it just, it's, that's what I talked about these coincidence things. There's some things you need, you can take it or leave it, but with that, I really connected with it. See, that poem itself, see when you read it, or like you first, you first encountered it, was that always in your mind, this has to find its way into its story, or did it find its way into the story by chance or by accident? I love that I love that poem. Um and I, as I say, it's been years. I'm getting a big vibration again, think about it. Um it's been years since I it's always been part I've always went back to it, if that if that makes sense. I've always went back to read it again. And I think uh, the part of the book it just seemed to fit so well and it connected in the book. So yeah, maybe subconsciously it was always going to get in there, and then just at the right time, um, it just seemed to fit so well. And the and again, going back to the name of the book, the light. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it ties in perfectly. So as you said, you just said there you're a breathwork coach and a guided meditation coach. See, doing that, what what was it that made you? Because you you're actually qualified as well. So at what point did you say to actually start to seek out a qualification in these uh, disciplines as such? So I've always wanted to try and move into, well, not always. I think, again, in the last four years, my journey has certainly now transitioned into what they help people, people like ourselves who've went through a journey of chaos and maybe try to come out the other side. So when I started to think, like, okay, how do I do that? What do I need to, what do I need to have to be able to give confidence in people that I can help them? And if you look on social media just now and like coaches, there's coaches everywhere, you know. And unfortunately, to go on social media, like you don't need to put up your qualifications, you don't need to say, like, I've got a master's, I've got this. And I I didn't want to be that I didn't want to be that person. Like I've got lived experience, yes, 
But I wanted to be able to back that up with theoretical knowledge so that if I'm helping someone, I can say, look, I've been through this. This was my journey. This is the modalities that are now helping me, the breath work, the meditation, ice bath therapy. Um, and how do I know they're helping me? Well, I've done the course. I can tell you all about the benefits, blah, blah, blah. Um, so that's that's why I wanted to get qualified. I wanted to make sure that not only to help myself, but so that I could then help others as well. Yeah, definitely, man. And it's uh, I think it's where you see the likes of breath work and stuff like that. People were so indoctrinated to think if if it's for free, it's not getting any worth. But the fact that breath work cold water therapy, you don't need to pay for it. You don't need to pay for cold water to a degree or if you do, you yeah. pay you could literally go to a lot and jump in it. You know what I'm yeah. talking about? So but these are these are what nature's wonder drug. Mm. So you said you went return to uni to do a bachelor's in neuropsychology. So was that part of? Did you have this like just this suddenly, this kind of epiphany almost like that, right? This is what I want to do. I want to help people. Or how did the idea come about to go back to uni? So like um, again, looking back to my affliction of the mental health side of things, I've always in any position that I've been in, I've always thought that I had to prove myself beyond belief you know so I've always been collecting certificates because in my mind if I get this qualification I'm justifying my job I'm getting I, I, I'm showing people that all oh, grants qualified so I went back to uni I think when I was 30 I'd done a bachelor's of science in health and safety I got that but because of my head that wasn't good enough so I went back and did a master's in occupational health safety and environmental management I got that in my head again, I still need to be better. So I done my chartered professional qualifications, and I got them. And when I got them, I was like, "They're like, good." But then, when I'm going through my own journey, my own spiritual journey, doing DMT, my 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 complete thought process starts to go down the line of I want to start helping people. I'd started to do a masters in performance psychology. Um, because I thought I wanted to stay in the corporate world and go into businesses and like, like look at their performance around that. But then I was thinking to myself, I don't want to do that. You know, I mean, I don't want to be in the corporate world. I want to help people like me. So I changed that in doing the masters of neuroscience and psychology of mental health. Because what I want to understand is we understand. Okay, we might say like anxiety. Okay, anxiety, worry about the future. You might feel. Like ten stop, your heart starts to go. But I wanted to know the neuroscience, what is in here, how can we then change in here? Um and again going back to where I wanted to be in maybe a couple of years' time doing the coaching, I wanted to make sure that I had the knowledge, the theoretical knowledge, along with my own experience, so that I could then guide people and try and help them as much as I can. Well, fantastic, man. See See, since you've been doing your bachelor's uh, in neuropsychology, where would you say the biggest thing you've learned or the most eye-opening thing you've learned about what, the human brain as such? So I guess um, I've only just started it, so I'm, I, I, I'm only into my second module, and the first module was all around like, the history of mental health. But one thing that was very, very interesting, um, and I can't remember exactly, it's like child acute child, it's called ACE, right? But basically what it states is, it talks about childhood trauma, and it talks about how children are brought up within a home. And the effect of that trauma later in life can manifest into things like cancer, high blood pressure, other types of diseases, not just depression and anxiety. I was like, for fuck's sake, I said that, I never knew that, like, so if, you, if you've, you've had childhood trauma as a child, you carry that trauma all your life. And again, going back to the fight or flight and um, freeze, your stress, your body's in stress all the time because of that trauma. And that, that effect in the body can then manifest into something like cancer. Wow. So that's a, that's a big eye opener. And I think looking back to my own experience where, like, okay, you could see a side of the times how my father treated us, but again, that sign of the times, that kind of physical abuse, that kind of mental abuse, 
and me, him thinking like maybe you're not good enough, you're a stupid idiot or whatever. That that lives with you, you know, and you then you then take that into your your adult life. I think there's a quote by Aristotle. Aristotle says, "Give me the give me the boy to seven, I'll show you the man." Because between two and seven, a child's brain waves is in theta, so that's they've been hypnotised. Mm. So between seven, the wee child's walking about like, oh, "This is great." So there's program and program and program, and then after seven, they go into alpha and they wake up. You know, they come in consciousness. So between zero and seven, you've got a huge opportunity to condition this child. You can either condition them for good or condition them for bad. And I think that that information should be known to teachers, primary school teachers, nursery teachers. And I know that I'm not I'm not a parent, and I know this is fucking probably the hardest job in the world. And people say, oh, there's not like a an instruction manual how to be a parent. And yeah, there's not. But at the same time, if you know things like this, if you know that between zero and seven, your wee child's been programmed, so let's fucking make them brilliant. You know what I mean? Let's program all the good stuff. And you need to be understanding that if you maybe say to them a flippant comment, oh, Grant, you're, you're fucking stupid, you're useless, that goes into their wee brain as well, and that can then manifest going forward. So that's, that's the biggest thing, you know, I think, like, educating people around the importance of children because then if we sort that's that's where the root is if we so if we if we make sure that we can prevent the children having trauma then potentially happy days you know you cut down everything your mental health the billions of pounds it's costing us um so yeah so that's very interesting I've, I've actually got um I'm working on three books just now, three children's books, which hopefully I'll get out in the next few months. And that's all based around that, this mental mental health and mental well-being for kids. Um, and it's all based around trying to... When somebody's reading the book to the child, they'll be understanding it themselves to say, right, this is a neuroscience. This is why I need to be doing this. And again, educating the child themselves from a young age to say, no, this is my mind. You know, I need to make sure that I'm, I'm watching what I'm putting in. So try to get that message across to teachers, primary school teachers, adults. I think it's hugely, hugely important. Definitely, definitely. And as I say, if I go back to that thing, we're in a kind of golden age of information because trauma-informed, it's such a buzzword these days. I listen to a a good bit of gab on my, a good friend of mine, James, he's an expert in trauma. And um, I think adverse childhood experiences, that might be, I've heard that, been uh, abbreviated as ACEs. And uh, I see it's, it's, it's trauma and see a child, children, as you say, like the ages of two to seven, you're in such a delicate, such a delicate state of your life. It's like you're so, so, so sensitive. Like, I remember I done, I done hypnotherapy. And my hypnotherapy, the reason I, I got it done, basically see if I ever went into like, uh, what I would class a high pressure situation, maybe some somewhere where there was a kind of an option for me to succeed, let's say if I would go into a boxing match or something like that, I would always get like, nerves to the point where my body would start to fill up with adrenaline and it would really affect my performance and, uh, and it would affect me in a number of ways in different performance scenarios. And I remember during the hypnotherapy, what, what was uncovered was when I was young, let's say people with my dad or something would I'd make, they would arrange plans to take me out, I'd get all excited about it. And I'd be a young child and they would cancel me, they wouldn't turn up and stuff like that. And it really affected me as a child. And I realised and that was what the reason was I was feeling like that. It was just feeling, oh, I must not be good enough. And these things as you get older, what the the root reason and some children they go through really horrific traumatic experiences which yeah. which of course affect them later in in life but there's also some things that when it happened as a child it's it, it affects you as a child but if it happened to you as an adult it wouldn't affect you as badly it's because as i say you're a child you're sensitive but they talk about you've still got that inner child in you that wounded child and that never really leaves you if you don't address it so 
when you realise that, it's like these things can manifest themselves. Like you find with a lot of insecure people, we go back to control. Like I've, I, I know some people, they're, they're very possessive in their relationships and then they don't realise it. But when you speak to them about their childhood, they never had a father figure. They were rejected yeah. by a father figure. And you can you can connect the dots. Yeah. You, you tie it up and you realise it's fucking powerful. I, I remember... Uh, Talking about ayahuasca, I remember a boy telling me a story. It was a friend of his. He had, uh, I think he had some sort of issues as well, I think, attachment issues or relationship issues. He'd done ayahuasca, and what it stemmed from was, I think he was wanting attention for his mother, and she was something like that. She just, I don't think she was really, I think she just said, no, the no. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know what, I don't know what, in what manner she says it, but I don't think it was in an abusive manner. I think it might have just been almost mild neglect. But Gabor Matty, he talks about that. It's like, um, well, well, what? You, if a child wants attention, if a child's angry, you can't really shut them down because that, that creates a traumatic response and that does affect you. So, and as you say, it's like there's no instruction manual to being a parent. There's never been, but now you're realising, wait a minute, it's a lot more complex because we forget, we forget. It's the, they talk about the theta and the beta brainwaves, but see, creating these children books, I think that's really important because... You can list the science, you can list the neuropsychology, you can get all the facts and figures, but you need to you need to articulate it in such a way that the average person can understand it because you know, the average parent is they are a university scholar or something. You get a lot of people that come work in class and mm-hmm. uh, exactly and if if you got a children's book, you're gonna read it to your children, as you say, you can both understand it in the same level. Yeah. No, well, again and uh, the Gabor Matia, I, I watch a lot of his stuff and he he will say you probably know, but he says like addiction can be related back to some form of childhood trauma. You know, like when if you're an, an addict, um, it's back to what's your experiences uh, as a child, and it's so so important. Um, and it is uh, again like testament to parents. It's very very difficult, and I think it's getting more difficult just with the situation in the UK and the situation with these things that kids are are just glued to. It. Um, so then, again, it's even more important now that the information is out there of the effects of these things, the effect of what your words can have on that child. So, yeah, very, very important and very, very interesting as well. Mm. It definitely is because it opens up a few worlds and it helps it, it helps you understand humanity, but it also helps you understand yourself and the way I look at my own thought processes because I don't know if it's... If this is a normal thing when people reach, I'm 32, you know what I mean? I'm getting on a bit. <laughs> I don't know if it's a normal thing when you reach the age of 30. You suddenly, I suddenly find myself where I might have a certain judgment on a person, on their actions, on something that might happen. I might have a certain thought process. And now, now these days, I'm starting to like, arrest myself in the moment and go, wait a minute, why do I think like that? And I'll be right, I'll try and trace it back. And a lot of the time, when you figure out, you're like, right, okay, and it's, it's suddenly just this, it's, it's like opening up the book into your own, into your own mental history. Yeah, it's fair. It's, I mean, it's, I think, like, and, and going back to the capabilities of that, the light that we have in us, if we can get rid of all this chatter, rid of all this shit, rid of all these thoughts, these negative thoughts, and we just let that light shine, you think, like, what you can do, you know, it'll be like, it will be truly unbelievable. Um, again, like going back to like, the neuroscience of it, the fact that you can reprogram your neural pathways, um, epigenet- ep- epigenetics, so we can actually change um, ourselves now, which we didn't think we could. So there's again going back to the information. We're information rich, and it's great to have all this information as long as we use it correctly and we we take we take the goodness out of it. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. So if I can ask. Well, as part of uh, the release of the light, you're raising money for a men's mental health charity, Men Matters. Uh, for every copy of the book sold, a pound's going to be donated to this charity. Can you tell me why is this charity so close to your heart? Well, I think um, so. What I wanted when I was writing the book, I didn't want people to say, "Oh, Greg's releasing a book and he's he wants to make money off it." When you start to understand the the kind of background of publishing a book, you don't make any money. <laughs> this fucking like I think like the royalties, um there's obviously print costs with Amazon, so Amazon take a certain amount. They'll take royalties as well. 
So I think the royalties on the paperback book to me is like two pounds fifty. It's retailing at ten ninety nine. Um, so I, I need to recoup some of my money back. Hence, not giving all the royalties to a charity, and because I've, I've still got some some costs. So I wanted to, again, going back to the message of the book, I wanted to help a men's mental health charity. I used to do a lot of work with, well, not a lot of work, but I used to support Chrissy's House over in Wisher and um, Farms, which is families affected by murder and suicide. They were based in Motherwell. With my health and safety training company, we done... Myself and my sister were trained mental health first aiders. So we offered three courses. Um, this is going back maybe five years. We managed to train 150 mental health first aiders in our local community, all for free. And the only thing we asked the delegates to do was to give money, donate to charity, donate to um, give us money so that we could give it to Chrissy's house and farms. And I think we managed to raise, it wasn't much, I think we gave maybe just over a thousand pounds to both the charities, but we, we managed to train 150 mental health first aiders. So for me, this message, and those, to put those courses on cost me a lot of money because I'm paying for certificates, I'm paying for um, the the training facilities, etc. But for me, it was never about the money, it was to give back, it was to raise the money for the, the charities. And the same with this as well. So I wanted to support a charity that I hadn't worked with before. And when I was doing my research, what I liked about Men Matter was that the guys actually go out on the street. You know what I mean? They'll say, they'll say, oh, the guys are out, they're, they're walking the streets tonight. If you want to go, go and chat to them. And I thought, wow, these guys are actually putting themselves out there, putting themselves in the fire line, if you like. And they're trying to, they're trying to raise as much attention awareness around men's mental health so that's why I picked Men Matter because of the, they're, they're out there they're getting their faces known, they're walking the streets and they are doing they are doing some great work uh, no, Fair play to them, that's, that's exactly what it needs it's like with charity, a lot of people are sceptical of charities these days because you do get a lot of bad press, eh? certain ones but it's, it's good to actually see, right this is where your money goes and it's mm -hmm. uh, and it's helping that helping cause that's it's, it's, it's a massive cause but it's, it's it's only just starting to kind of get get its, its credits for the serious dislike men's mental health because as you say, there's that thing. I think guys, especially growing up in the west of Scotland, you know what I mean? It's that way. It's, no, you need to be tough. And it's still kind of like that. You need to look tough. Mm -hmm. but the, the toughest guys you might class are the bad guy for the scheme, the guys that get all the respect. They're probably the most traumatised. You know I mean? That's a trauma response. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, 100%. Mm -hmm. So right now, Grant, the book is released, it's out now on Amazon. What is the plans next? So yeah, so fingers crossed, um, I've got book number two. I've started to kind of get the structure for that, doing some, um, writing down some notes and stuff. As I mentioned, I'm working on these, this series of children's books, so they sh that should hopefully be out. Probably by the time I get animated and things like that, it's probably going to be another six months. Um, and I say, I say that I'm quite very much excited about them because it's going to, get the neuroscience and everything all together. It's going to be the breath work, meditation. Um, so working on them, working on book number two, get this master's. My master's will be finished within a year and a half and then completely transition into coaching, online coaching. Um, I want to do a bit of travelling as well. So hopefully if I get online coaching, I'll just be able to travel, go anywhere, dip in and out to the coaching um, and just try and maybe share the message, raise the message around mental health, not just men's mental health, but mental health in general. Um, and yeah, try and, try and make as much of a difference as I can. Fantastic, man. Fantastic. And uh, as I say, the, the book's a great read. I urge anybody that's uh, watching this to go and get yourself a copy. And as I say, there's going to be proceeds from the book going to a great cause. So, Grant, it's been an absolute pleasure having you. I love your story. I connect with it. I can relate to it in so many ways. I've, I've, I've loved so many aspects of your life myself, man. So uh, hats off to you uh, for articulating the book. And it was a great read. I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you, Gordon. I really enjoyed the podcast. Can I just ask one more thing. And uh, I usually ask at the end of the podcast if uh, the guests would like to impart some, some words of wisdom 
for uh, the youth that may be watching. I get a lot of young people that watch my channel, but also if there's anybody that's maybe struggling mentally, whether it may be men, maybe women, maybe anybody, however, however they want to describe themselves, have you got any kind of message of hope or inspiration you'd be willing to pass on to Yeah, I think um, the part that in the book that I've kind of done the dedication, this book is dedicated to, um, there's a paragraph that states like, this book is dedicated to all the warriors, all the warriors that are fighting their own mental health demon, the warriors that get up every day, fight their demon while still holding your down job, supporting family, supporting friends, and managing the day-to-day -day pressures of life. Make no doubt about it, you are a warrior if you can do that every single day. Um, and I, th I think the dedication then goes on to stay. These warriors do this in silence. But please, if you are one of these warriors, if you are fighting this daily battle with your mental health demon, don't be afraid to talk. Don't be afraid to reach out. Because you will find there's an abundance of warriors out there that are ready to pick up arms, run into battle, and slay that demon with you. And I think that's the most important thing is, if you are struggling, just reach out. You know, speak to someone, speak to your friends, speak to your parents. Find somebody like us, you know what I mean, that's got lived experience. There's a huge amount of men's charities out there now, um, independent ones as well that are doing like kind of meets on a Wednesday night or a Friday night. So there's there's options out there. Um, and don't, as I say, like when you think about mental health, when you think about men's mental health, and why, as a man, we don't want to talk about it, it does go back to that stigma of a weakness. It's a weakness. But again, like I say, if you're up every single morning battling that demon, you're a fucking warrior. You know what I mean? You are a warrior. And you use that power. It's the same if somebody's battling cancer. Five-year battle, ten-year battling cancer, and then they beat it. That guy's a warrior. That woman's a warrior. And it's the exact same with mental health. It's a fucking disease of the brain. And I think we need to realise that. And if people are, are battling it, then take that as a strength. But reach out, reach out, because people will help you. Mm -hmm. Definitely, and that's it. It's, uh, the minute you, you give it air, you speak it out, man, you you take the control away from it, or you take the power it has away from it. And you, man, because it's bought on up, it's, it's a let. I always say it's like a tyre. It's like it's like air in a tyre. It's like air seamless, air it floats. It's, it's nothing, but you put that in a tyre, you pump up a tyre, the tyre suddenly becomes solid. Air becomes very, very dangerous. And yeah, you continue to fill that tyre without releasing the valve. Tyres are eventually going to pop. Yeah, that's a great analogy. I like that. I'll use that. Ah, <laughs> uh, you can use that. You can use that. Make, make, make sure you shout, mate. Make sure you shout. Yeah. So uh, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on, Grant. As yeah. I say, uh, we've known each other for some time. Uh, it's been really good to finally get you in the podcast. Yes. And having read your book, it's been a great read. And uh, I urge anybody that want to get it, I'm going to attach a link below to right. the Amazon link. You can get yourself a copy. And as I say, for every book sold, a pound goes to Men Matters. If there's anybody that might be watching this, Grant, that might connect with your story, that might want to reach out, how would be the best way to get in contact with yourself? Just find them. Um, so my Instagram handle is the light under slash mindset. Um, just contact me through that. Facebook, if you search Grant Aird, um, it's not like picture. It's just that they says the light. Um, so it's just like the kind of the name of the book, which is my um, handle on Facebook as well. Reach out that way. Um, I'll be happy to talk. Um, through through the the Instagram social medias, I'm actually helping a couple of guys just now through people reaching out, which has been great. You know, people have connected, people have seen that I've got a story, um, I've got lived experience, and that they've reached out as well, which is exactly what I'm wanting, you know what I mean, to try and start helping people. So yeah, reach out, don't be afraid. Um, as I say, there's a million people in the same position that you're in, so just, just talk about it. Yeah, million percent, man, million percent. Well, Grant, it's been an absolute pleasure. I've really enjoyed having you on the podcast, and I wish you nothing but good luck for the future. Thank you. Thank you, mate. Thank you. Pleasure's all mine, right? That's been Grant Air. People, go get his book and check him out. Like, subscribe, and don't get wide. Catch his. <laughs>